Hi guys, Olive here. I'm here today with a very special guest. This is my friend, Josh. Hi everyone. <laughs> I've been trying to convince Josh to come on and have a chat with me for a while now because Josh is an expert, in my opinion anyway, on beer. So you're not a reading fanatic. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely has to pique my interest. Yeah, but I have been pressuring you. This is true. As pretty do, pretty much every day. I've known you. Yeah, that's it's just what happens when you're in my life. You get pressured to read a lot of books. Well, slowly but surely, we're getting there. It's true, you read one, which is what we're talking about today. Yes. It's surprisingly enough, you're the one who found this. I did. Uh, I actually found this on one of my craft beer pages. I'm trying to get into the scene a little bit more. I had actually seen a post on one of the pages regarding the top five takeaways from this book, which made me interested in actually reading the book uh, after I had read the article. And that book is... Barrel Age Stout and Selling Out, Goose Island, Anheuser-Busch, and How Craft Beer Became Big Business by Josh Knoll. You're not the author. This not the a, author. This is a different Josh. Different Josh. <laughs> this book was published this year, and Josh Knoll is, I think we said, a lifestyle writer for the Chicago Tribune. So Josh, since you are the expert, can you please give us a slight background about what this book is about? First off, I would like to clarify, we are using the word expert very loosely here. <laughs> I'm using the word expert. Right. I consider myself more of an enthusiast, but I am looking to learn more about the industry, whether it's the local beers or also in this case, uh, one of the bigger breweries in terms of volume and presence in the United States. As we find in the book, they are focusing on a segment that they were not able to infiltrate by themselves. Essentially, this book outlines the history of Goose Island uh, from the founders, John Hall, and who wound up being the head brewer, his son, Greg Hall. So this book focuses on the history of Goose Island, how it was founded, how they became one of the more innovative and revolutionary craft brewers in the United States, mm -hmm. then focusing on how the world's biggest beverage conglomerate and Hazard Bush InBev bought the company in order to fulfill category that they were not able to do themselves. Ultimately, how this shaped both Goose Island and as well as the craft beer industry uh, in America as well as the world. So Goose Island is a brewery that was started in Chicago. I want to say it was around 1988 was when John Hall founded the actual brewery itself. And at the time, craft beer wasn't even really a thing. What was running the beer scene were all the big breweries. So, House of Bush, Budweiser, Miller. Coors. It was really interesting in the book when he was talking about what the beer scene was like before Kraft came along and how they were basically in competition with each other of how to make it the least flavorful possible, how to make it the lightest. That's true. They were really looking for the more approachable beers, the styles that we know now as the light beers or macro lagers that these companies are putting out. The big thing was for them to develop these beers that really had the least amount of taste in order to conform to the everyday American palate. People who grew up in the United States and were used to drinking this beer, the flavorless, what I like to call beer-flavored beer that we all know and definitely do not love. <laughs> we all know. We all know. End of sentence. Yes. <laughs> Europe typically had the traditional styles, the lagers, the pilsners. These have been uh, beers that were created for hundreds of years, if not more. Full-bodied, actually had flavor. Uh, beers that were more sophisticated. Lovingly crafted. Lovingly crafted, uh, more so than what America was serving up at the time. Big transition as well with the craft beer industry in the late 80s was the fact that a lot of home brewers who didn't want to drink the macro beers, the beer-flavored beers, started making their own. They wanted that flavor in their beer, and these were beers that, honestly, at the time weren't available. A lot of the times, these beers were actually made by the breweries in Europe, whether it was the Belgians, Germans, uh, Czechs, and the only times that these were accessible to people who brewed at home were to get them in bottle shops and smaller beer markets in their local cities. So rather than having to rely on that, a lot of people decided that they were going to start brewing themselves. Once that took off among their friends, you know, everyone says, oh, you make this beer, why don't you make it for everyone? So along comes Goose Island, right. and they're facing a market that is very, very used to beer-flavored beer. Yes. So they start brewing things, and they have to kind of take it easy at first, because Americans aren't going to be super receptive, and this is in Chicago, so even like a young urban area, they still have to be careful. They opened a brew pub 
and their most popular beer at that time was the Blondale. He's going to use his beers as a gateway into trying the different styles that he has produced. You know, if you like Miller Lite, try this beer. I think you're going to find that it is approachable, but it's going to have more flavor. And then when he was able to convert people onto that, open their eyes a little bit saying, oh, beers with flavor are actually good and a good thing. <laughs> Hey, try this now. Yeah. Here's what else we have to offer. And then they started getting bolder in the different things that they were brewing. Yes. While accompanying that with a lot of smart marketing. So Goose Island takes it easy at first, trying to push in and find a space for themselves, specifically in Chicago at this time. But then they started getting a little inventive and start making something called Barrel Age Stout, which was not a thing before they started doing this. Right. Uh, Greg Hall, when he took over brewing operations from the original brewer of Goose Island, he, he was a bit of an innovator. He wanted to do basically something that no one had ever done before. Goose Island's famous Bourbon County brand stout was invented in 1992, I believe, was the first time that they brewed this. Possibly also 1995, based on later records. So for those not familiar with the brewing process, certain grains are malted, dried, ground, added with water and yeast in order to ferment and produce what we know as beer. So for their flagship Honkers Ale, they use 550 pounds of malt per batch. A typical imperial stout uses about 800 pounds of malt. More malt ultimately means higher alcohol. So the conversion process of the sugars from malting, adding the water, the yeast feeds on that sugar to produce alcohol, more sugar, more alcohol. Bourbon County brand stout used 1,550 pounds of malt in their inaugural bash. Uh, Greg Hall said that the mash was actually overflowing. <laughs> I remember that part. <laughs> from from the mash tun and into the fermentation tank. Again, it was something that no one had ever thought to make before, that big of a beer. And then not only that, to actually put that in bourbon barrels to age, which was revolutionary at the time. No one had ever done that before. We have talked about what exactly barrel aging lends to a beer. Please elaborate. <laughs> Speaking as a bourbon guy as well, uh, the barrel aging process when it comes to spirits, wine, beer is inherently the same. The liquid goes into a charred oak barrel, in bourbon's case, a brand new American oak barrel, charred on the inside. This charring caramelizes the sugars in the barrel, and that over time, due to temperature fluctuations, as well as just the time being spent in the barrel, the wood will actually pull in the liquid, whether it is a spirit, beer, what have you. The barrel contracts, brings in beer, pushes it out, and ultimately that's what really gives the flavor. So we're talking about bourbon. It starts off being a clear spirit. The barrel aging process will give you color, flavor, and aroma that the original spirit did not have. So when you put beer in a used bourbon barrel, yes, I love the way he describes this in the book. The beer is moving kind of in and out of the pores of wood. Just like it would with the original whiskey. So it's not just getting the flavors of the wood, it's also getting all the leftover bourbon. Let's back up, back to Goose Island and the invention of uh, bourbon barrel aged stouts. Because this was a very innovative product that the market had never seen before. They did not know how to classify it when Goose Island would take it to shows and tried to show it off. It didn't even like have its own category because it was such a weird thing that no one had ever seen, but it kind of blew everybody away. Yeah, at the time there was no bourbon barrel age or even barrel age category at the Great American Beer Fest in Denver. Again, this was the first brewery that had ever done anything like this, and it really opened a lot of people's eyes to what beer could be. So on one hand, Goose Island was doing innovative products like the bourbon with barrel aged stout, like barley wine, which is a thing I did not know existed until I met you. Uh, <laughs> but then they also were doing more approachable beers, like the 312, which is named for Chicago's area code. And they were doing the Honkers Ale. That was the first one that they pushed out beyond just Chicago when they were trying to expand. So Goose Island started doing so much business because they were representing both sides like the higher end and also the more mass appeal type beers, they were expanding so quickly, they weren't able to keep up with demand. But they started to grow so much that they're not really able to keep up with the demand that was flowing in. They just didn't have the physical capacity to brew the beer as quickly as they needed to. So this is where we get into big beer infiltrating the craft beer scene. Infiltrating. Anheuser-Busch, Budweiser, tried making their own craft beer brands. They realized that craft beer in 2010 
was at the time only a couple percent of overall beer sales in America. But they saw it as a nuisance because it was cutting into their market share, which was huge before craft beer came exactly. along. Exactly. Budweiser, Anheuser-Busch, and Bev had approximately 50% of the beer share in the United States. That's including Kraft, Imports, the other two big breweries in Miller and Coors, which also merged. But Anheuser-Busch knew that craft beer was a threat. They knew that their beer was reaching the, the people that they intended it to, the regular average Joe. They tried coming up with other brands in order to get into the craft beer scene. Anheuser-Busch knew that they needed some type of market share with the craft beer scene. Mm -hmm. They tried manufacturing it and doing it on their own. They realized that wasn't working because people at the time knew what a good beer was. And these beers, because they were being mass produced, didn't meet the same criteria that these smaller batch beers had. You can't beat them, essentially join them. By joining them really means buying them. Yes. So the 2011 purchase of Goose Island really opened up the doors for Anheuser-Busch to enter the craft beer scene. How this really affected Goose Island and why they decided to sell to Anheuser-Busch in the first place was the fact that they knew that in order to grow the brand, in order to have the vision that John Hall wanted, which was to have 312 basically available in every bar, was to actually partner up with a big beer conglomerate such as Anheuser-Busch and Bev. Having this partnership would give them more money and resources to expand the brand while also, you know, being able to meet the demand. To be able to get bigger, Goose Island needed more physical space. They needed more people. They needed more marketing power. But they needed a more physical capacity to actually brew the beer itself. Right. With a small brewery, you're talking about inherent limitations with how much they're able to produce. And so to grow as any small business wants to, it's really hard when you don't have the capital to do that. So reading this, I've been really interested to have this discussion with you because reading this, I felt for them so much. Right. And the big question I have for you that we can continue then through the rest of this video is, do you think the whole concept of craft beer of independent brewing runs opposite of the idea of capitalism? Because to be a small business, you want to be growing, you need to be growing. That is the whole concept of capitalism. But if craft breweries have an upper limit of how much they can grow to still be considered craft, how does that work? So there's really, I think, two, two sides on this. There are the breweries that are established in order to be sold for a profit. Which you see some of those in the book. John Hall actually had every intention of having this brewery, mm -hmm. growing this brewery, and then ultimately having an exit plan. I think initially he said he wanted to sell this to Heineken. So having the biggest beer producer in the world come knocking at his door wasn't exactly something that he was able to turn away from. You know, he was getting to the retirement age. He had sunk a lot of his own money and savings into the brewery. Mm -hmm. So being able to not only grow the brand further and also have that cash windfall that he initially intended on... Mm -hmm. I feel was a win-win for John Hall. Whether or not craft brewing is the, how did you phrase that? The I don't even remember antithesis of capitalism? Sure, we'll go with that. You know, it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, there are some very successful independent craft breweries that are making a ton of money, but also sticking to their laurels and keeping things independently owned, family run. Everyone goes into business essentially to make money. For craft breweries... Initially, yeah, they want to make money, but their their heart is on the product. They want to make the best available product that they can with the best ingredients, and some of them are still sticking to it. Other breweries realize that they can still make these good beers while also lining their pockets. I don't, I don't know, I don't know if it's, I don't know if craft brewing goes against capitalism. I think in some cases they can really go hand in hand. I don't know. This was such a hard book for me to read because I could see both sides of it. Because a lot of people said that they sold out, that right. selling to Anheuser-Busch was the epitome of selling out, of betraying craft brewing, betraying what it's all about, betraying Your the, roots. Yeah, the roots and the story behind the beer. That's something that Josh Knoll really makes a point of making that distinction between big beer and small beer, is saying that Small beer has a story behind it. There's a story behind the name. These days, it's typically something quirky. <laughs> <laughs> 
but there's a story behind Greg Hall making the barrel aged style. Like there's there's a romanticism to small beer that big beer just cannot have. Reading this book, I felt very much conflicted about craft brewers selling out to these big beer conglomerates. And I'm still kind of on the fence about it. I like the fact that in terms of a brewery such as Ballast Point out in San Diego, I like that I can get a sculpt in here in Pennsylvania. But the fact that, you know, I feel I feel dirty about it. <laughs> I had one of the Goose Island beers uh, during happy hour on Wednesday, one of their uh, barrel aged saisons called Sophie. I saw it on the menu and wanted to try because of the book. Because mm-hmm. this was one of their actual craft beers that even after the buyout from Anheuser-Busch still continued to be made in Chicago. It's something that I actually really enjoyed. It was a really good beer, but I still felt dirty about it because, you know, the money that I spend on that beer is not going to Goose Island. It's going to Anheuser-Busch, which is still trying to, as much as they're looking to help craft beer, which is what they like to say, they're still trying to bury craft beer. They figure if they have enough market share with the beers that they control, they're going to get a piece of of the pie regardless. If they could have it their way, craft brewing wouldn't exist because right. then they would have their market share back. So it's, you know, they're not being entirely honest. You want to believe them. And now they own all these breweries. You want to think that they have at least some moral integrity that when you're drinking one of their beers, like, well, they can't be all bad. They own these breweries, but they still are very aggressive. And dishonest. Right. And one of their tactics, too, is for as much as they say that they're trying to support craft beer, they're actually, like, banking on craft beer. They want you to go to your local brewery and try, let's say, a really good IPA. They want you to try that in the brew pub, and they say, oh, well, there's this IPA that Goose Island makes. I can go to the beer distributor and get that. So they're looking to piggyback off craft beer as well. They're looking for people to be introduced to good beer elsewhere and then come and then see their lower price point because they can afford to do that. Right. And they want you to pick their beer up instead. They also want you to believe that their beer is on par with something that you would get at your local craft brewery. They don't want you to know who they own and they may get a real point to keep that hidden. It's just a little bit deceitful in terms of how they are representing the the beer brands that they do own now. They want you to have, as Greg Koch, the founder of Stone Brewing in California, is the an illusion of choice. They want you to think that you have a choice with what you're drinking based on the different brands that they own. They want you to think that these are still independently owned craft breweries. And again, I've gone to bars and I'm sure I've had a good beer from a small brewery that they had purchased, none the wiser. But even though... Anheuser-Busch does have these brands and they still might be producing a decent product. The beer at Goose Island changed. It did. So the flagship beers, the beers that they were constantly in production, uh, Honker's Ale, their IPA, 312, these were the beers that wound up moving to the Anheuser-Busch different facilities across the country. Uh, Beers that they could scale up and make on such a larger scale than what they were producing, which did two things. It gave them the supply for their demand issues Mm -hmm. and also allowed the brewers at Goose Island, in theory, to create more innovative beer, which they had already been doing, Mm -hmm. leaving the production in Chicago to focus mainly on those beers, their sour uh, beer program, their Mm -hmm. barrel age program, more specialty beers. The problem that they ran into when you're scaling up such, you know, I'm not going to say they were making them on a small scale, but in terms of what... In comparison, definitely. In comparison, yes, was a challenge. Not only in scaling up the recipes themselves, but because the brewing equipment was different, the way it ferments and reacts with everything had to be fine too. And I think they dumped the first three batches of 312 because it was just completely off from what the original product had been. Can we really expect it to be the same? No, not in a situation like that. I mean, I hate to be like really pretentious about it, but I'm going to be really pretentious about it. It's not brewed with the same love. On such a large scale. No, it's not. (laughs) Anheuser-Busch will make you think that, you know, they're brewing it with... I mean, they still have their their standards that they have to meet. And Mm. and to be honest, as much as I don't like beer-flavored beer, the way that they're able to do that and produce Budweiser and Bud Light at maybe 10 to 12 different breweries throughout the country, and it all tastes the same... It's that, amazing. That's amazing to me. And the quality control. That's what really impressed me about yes. all of that when they had the Anheuser-Busch people come in. And it is impressive that 
with all the different water sources and all the different places that they're sourcing ingredients from, that the brewers are able to get this consistent no matter where you get it, when you get it. To me, that's amazing. And I do have to give Anheuser-Busch credit for that because from what I read, Budweiser is not an easy beer to brew. These craft beers, while very good, there are a lot of different things that you can add to them and have different flavorings and, and whatnot. For what, what, what Budweiser is, which is your just standard, typical macro lager, it's, there's not a lot of different flavors to hide behind. If there's an off flavor from something in the brewing process, it's going to be picked up right away. So the fact that they are able to make this on such a large scale that they are, and everything's consistent and tastes the same, it really is you know, a feather in the cap to Anheuser-Busch. Yes, absolutely. But then when you're trying to take something like craft beer, which is made in small batches, and like you said, you can put a lot of different things in it, there's a lot more that you're capable of when you're brewing small quantities of beer. Yes. You can experiment. If something goes wrong, you're not throwing away as much beer. That's not as much money literally down the drain. But can you really hand over something like Goose Island 312 to Budweiser and expect it to be the same? It's not. Like I said, they, they dumped the first three batches because they were so off. And I think they ultimately settled on the fourth or fifth batch, not because it was perfect, not because it met every standard that Goose Island had originally set, but it's, it was close enough. It was close enough to what the original product intended to be. I think everyone involved was happy with it. They actually had a panel of current people from Anheuser-Busch, as well as some of the brewers from Goose Island to taste test the beer that was actually made in Chicago for 312, and then the different batches. And obviously the people from Chicago, the brewers from Chicago and Goose Island, knew what the original was supposed to taste like and what it did taste like, mm -hmm. and they agreed that this one was essentially good enough for it. Yeah, which kind of goes against what they were saying to all their employees and to the public when they sold, saying nothing's going to change. Ultimately, when Anheuser-Busch came in, changes were made in terms of overall safety. They imp you know, implemented a lot of different safety features that Goose Island did not have, yes. which ultimately made things safer for the employees. Yeah, absolutely. When everything was said and done, they really had no input into the brand whatsoever in terms of how this would be rolled out to the rest of the nation, as well as uh, innovation beers being done by the brewers. Mm -hmm. They wanted to come up with things, and Anna Hauser, of course, says, we're going to tell you what to brew. I think they believed it was going to change a whole lot less than it ended up changing, which is a shame. And I know that Greg Hall then, later in the book, would tell other brewers who sold to Anheuser-Busch, don't tell your employees nothing is going to change. Instead, say something like, when's a year when things didn't change? Right. Because there's going to be change, but that's kind of also just the nature of business. Seeing as they were the first craft brewery to actually be purchased by, you know, one of the large beer conglomerates, it was an experiment. No one knew how this was going to turn out. No one knew how or what was going to change until everything just actually happened. What is the definition of craft? Josh Noll makes an attempt to define what exactly a craft beer is. The Brewers Association definition of craft beer is independently owned with less than 25% being owned by a corporation, small, traditional, independent. Yes. Small being under 6 million barrels of production a year, traditional meaning no adjuncts to the beer to just brew the beer. It has to be for a purpose in terms of flavor, taste, and then the ownership issue of craft beer. They've also implemented a logo for breweries that have this designation to put on their packaging as part of being a small, independently owned craft brewery. Where do you think Josh Knoll sits on this issue? Because I felt something when I was reading it, but uh, I'm interested to know what you think. For the most part, I thought he was trying to be objective in telling the story. Yes. Uh, he didn't really skew one way or another. He, it was more informative. Uh, I feel that the relationships that he developed with the people that he was interviewing for this book would probably lead him to skew on the side of craft beer yeah. ra rather than supporting Anheuser-Busch. But I thought overall he did a very unbiased job of telling the story of, of Goose Island and Anheuser-Busch. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think he really did a good job in showing the benefits that were bestowed upon the breweries who were bought by Anheuser-Busch and what the might of Anheuser-Busch could bring to a small brewery. But I did feel a very strong bias toward craft beer. And I can't blame him for it. I have a very strong bias toward craft beer, too. But I felt that. And I felt that he was very critical of the halls. I'm, in some cases, they definitely deserve that. Um, but I think he painted the halls for who they were. No, I had no idea that they were the pioneers of 
barrel aged stouts and the sour beer program. This was nothing that any brewery in America was really doing at the time. That Even, takes that takes a lot of guts to do something that nobody else is doing, which is why big beer will never be in that arena. They right. don't want to throw money at something they don't think is going to make money. But knowing that they started brewing this massively in Anheuser Busch facilities, and the you know the fall off of the beer itself that they were having for their mass distribution and their national rollout makes complete sense. You know, to me now, it makes sense as to why I maybe didn't really like these beers as much as, as other beers from other breweries. My opinions were initially low of them, and they're still low with the fact that they sold out, but they've, again, they've done so much innovation for the industry that, yep, someone else would have probably done it eventually, but... It's hard to measure someone's contribution, but we do know that they did it first. Yeah. I think this is a great time to open some beer. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. But thank you very much for reading the book with me. Thank you for finding the book, first and foremost. I was trying to find us a book on beer and couldn't decide on anything. And this was just absolutely perfect. Yeah, luckily, I just read that post probably a day or two before. so And had the beer. Thank you very much for sharing this Oh, with you're me. welcome. I'm not able to appreciate it as much as you, but I'm trying. And thank you for coming on and joining me today. I'm sure everyone, including me, learned a whole lot. Well, thank you for having me. It was uh, definitely a pleasure, and you know, maybe we'll do this again one day. Thank you so much for joining us today on this Nonfiction November video. If you have any comments or questions about anything you've seen in this video or anything in general, you know the drill down in the comment section below. Or I am on a variety of different places on social media. The links to all of my profiles are down in the description box below. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Drink local. Indeed. Bye.